Right, apologies for the um, screw up at the start there. I'll just dive straight in. So I'm Joseph Lindley. I'm a doctoral student at Lancaster University in the UK. And my co-author is Paul Coulton, who's Professor of Speculative and Game Design also at Lancaster. Um, today I'm talking about creating and publishing research papers that are entirely made up. So this is pushing design fiction to the limit. Now you might ask, what fictional research papers? Well, one thing that we're, we're worried people have been thinking is that what's represented here, that we're just making up research because research is actually difficult. Well, research is difficult, but actually we hope there's something more to this and there's actually a, a useful um, kernel of knowledge in there. So the way the presentation is set up is really mirroring the paper itself. Like the train, it's just a gratuitous metaphor. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. In the beginning, we offer just an introduction to design fiction, a kind of related work section. Our review is particularly broad and tries to cover the breadth of design fiction in HCI altogether. Um, by the middle, we go into an overview of one particular way of using design fiction in HCI called Imaginary Abstracts, which was introduced a couple of years ago by Mark Blythe. And then we describe and explore Game of Drones, which is our example fictional paper. Um, by the end, we contrast imaginary abstracts with fictional papers. Um, we highlight some apparent strengths and weaknesses. And we do that in order to finally advocate for fictional papers. Finally, we note some questions that this, this work has raised. So before anything else, I just want to address what design fiction actually is. Um, we'll get to a bit more of a formal definition shortly, but in plain English, I would say that design fiction is just a type of speculative design, and speculative design intends to explore yet-to-be-realized concepts, ideas, or, and or technologies. It tries to understand the future. And design fiction does this speculative designing in a particular way. It does it by creating fictional worlds, and these fictional worlds contain prototypical concepts. HCI researchers, as you'll see with some of the, the stuff on the screen here, have embraced the concept and applied it in a whole range of different ways. And our related work section at the start of the paper tries to explore some of these approaches in order to mainly to establish the breadth of design fiction practice in HCI. Um, just a few quick examples here. There are projects that center entirely around the production of a design fiction prototype or a design fiction artifact. These projects have much in common with other research through design projects. One example is this short paper and film from Nordic Kai 2014 that I was involved in. And the, the, the work offers insights about artificially intelligent interfaces. And the insights are mainly derived by reflecting on the making process and on the finished product itself. So this, this is one way of doing design fiction in HCI. There's also projects that use design fiction mainly as a workshop tool. It's, I would say it's a way of facilitating ideation to unpack and explore new ideas. And this relatively well-cited paper in the, in the field is one such, um, one such project. There's several examples in the corpus of HCI design fiction where it's used as a critical tool. In this mode, we can say design fiction is may be used as a stimulus to generate data or develop critical insights from which findings can be derived. This one is an example of, that's critical of gadgetry designed for animals with things like the litter bug, the catalogue, and a moti dog. And if you haven't seen it, I would check it out. Um, design fiction can also be an output for a more traditional project. Um, speculative designers can encapsulate research findings into a new design fiction. In this example, the original study was a, a kind of ethnographic study, and the output was a, a series of design fictions. One is shown on the right, and these were made in the form of um, kind of product advertisements. Uh, finally, the related work section acknowledges the fact that design fiction exists entirely independently of academia and of HCI. It's practiced by corporations, artists, and design houses, amongst other people. Um, and just to reflect on the related work section a little bit before I move on, it's there to showcase the diversity of how design fiction is practiced, demonstrating its flexibility, but then also to acknowledge that design fiction is what I'm saying is pre-paradigmatic. Um, the understanding why it's used, how to do it, and even to succinctly, succinctly define what it is, 
all of those things are often quite problematic um, and hard to express, so please bear that in mind for the, for the rest of the presentation. Um, on the issue of definition, the paper refers to Bruce Sterling's frequently cited phrase, design fiction is the intentional use of diegetic prototypes to suspend disbelief about change. And in this definition, diegesis is usually, usually considered to mean story worlds, as I labelled here. Um, <laughs> Sterling's definition works great, but I just want to add that in our 2015 British HCI paper that calls for clarity around communications to do with design fiction, we offered an alternative. Um, we say that design fiction is something that creates a story world which has something being prototyped within it. And that definition might seem somewhat vague because something in both instances can mean literally anything. It might be the something that creates a story world is a piece of prose or a film or an art installation or anything, maybe an academic abstract or a paper. And the thing being prototyped within it could be anything from a data input device, a display, a new type of vehicle, or even a whole policy. So it can be something that's doing something or anything. I've labeled that as well. <laughs> the flexibility is purposeful. It allows us to articulate that things like abstracts or whole papers can be the thing that creates the story world and that the prototype, concept, or interface described by that is the thing being prototyped. It also avoids the somewhat tricky philosophy that surrounds that notion of diegesis in Sterling's definition. Now, I just want to get onto the, the middle section, imaginary abstracts. Um, these are a particular type of design fiction that's tailor-made for HCI research or HCI researchers. And the term was coined by Mark Blythe in a 2014 Kai paper, these abstracts report findings from studies that did not take place, and it's suggested that as part of a research through design project, imaginary abstracts might be a means of reflecting on what could be learned through, the prototype, through a prototype's development. I say it's a prototype prototype, if you will. Um, Mark went to some lengths in his original paper on this topic to analyze a corpus of literature and the purpose of that was to ensure that the imaginary abstracts, the, the fictional abstracts, would appear real. Um, so these imaginary abstracts mirror real research through design abstracts. Now I'd say in spite of the length gone to to make those design fictions believable and accessible, Mark still acknowledges that the, the crazy concept he's introducing requires a willing suspension of disbelief from the reader. Even when they're made to look real, abstracts for research prototypes that are fictitious, the whole thing's clearly challenging. And this paper that I'm presenting to you now introduces a slightly different proposition that I think is a logical extension of this notion of imaginary abstracts. Rather than limiting yourself to writing an abstract, how about writing a fully fictional paper? How would that differ? And to re-quote Mark's words about imaginary abstracts, please bear with me while I talk you through our example fictional paper that's called Game of Drones. Now, the first thing to note when we refer to fictional papers is we're not suggesting that the, the paper itself does not exist. Rather, that the content in the paper is part of a story. The text itself is real, while what the words describe is a fiction. So this fictional paper is called Game of Drones. It's a short paper that I and Paul wrote in 2015 and we submitted to Kaiplay's work in progress track where it went through a, a, a peer review process, a slightly lighter peer review process than um, the full Kai conference though. Now, to tell you the story of the paper, it describes a prototype system where quadcopter drones are trialed as part of a gamified civic enforcement initiative. Users score points by catching fellow citizens who park illegally or allow their dogs to foul on the streets. And they catch them by piloting these drones around remotely. Um, the paper does various things. It, it writes up details of the trial, including who the users were, who the people involved in the trial were, what hardware was used. Um, we had to rewrite UK legislation to make the trial feasibly, feasible in terms of uh, legality. We designed some landing stations, which you can see around the middle of the poster there. Um, we designed some signage, considered the data protection policies. There's a whole load of stuff that didn't make it into the paper of fake data and graphs and things that I created. Um, the paper does describe itself as design fiction, 
It informs the reader that the whole project was not real. However, interestingly, it does that at the very end of the paper. Um, also, this video was submitted with it demonstrating what such a system might look like. Um, now, just before I go into a bit more detail on it, is I want to note that Game of Thrones isn't the only example of a paper that's entirely fictional that you'll find archived in the ACM Digital Library as part of Kai. Um, the Terminator et al.'s Kai and the Future Robot Enslavement of Humankind, a retrospective, is another example of one whose content is entirely made up. It different, differs from Game of Drones, though. Um, Game of Drones is actually quite boring, the paper. It's, it's cold, it has no humor in it, and it's somewhat somber. It's, it's trying to be as objective as possible, or appear as objective as possible for something that's made up. Whereas the robot enslavement paper, well, I mean, it's written by a team of robots and features people like Ben the Terminator Kerman. Um, so while it's clearly a bit more interesting, a bit more exciting, and it's, I mean, it's got that long word in the keywords, so I don't know what that means. But both papers are equally unreal. But Game of Thrones is intentionally masquerading as reality. But why? Well, the, I mean, the robot paper is trying to be critical of something. But what's this fictional paper that's trying to appear real trying to do? What, what's the point of it? Well, the simplest way to explain that is to refer to a quote at the end of Game of Drones. I'm going to read through it for you, but it's up on the screen too. The research in this paper and the associated artifacts are part of a design fiction. Therefore, whilst this paper presents a fictional account of plausible future HCI research, its purpose is not only to highlight the potential usability or utility issues such systems might present, but also to create a discursive space in which researchers can consider the wider societal and ethical issues of technological futures in which drones might be widely adopted. But then it finishes with, in future publications we will consider the effectiveness of this design fiction in, order to ad in addressing such challenges and design fiction more generally as a method for exploring issues related to introduction of technologies. Now, it's the note about future work that I think is the most significant. And the future work that we referred to there turned out to be this paper I'm presenting to you now. And this paper advocates for the creation of fictional research papers like Game of Drones. And to do that as a means mainly to explore practical issues about the introduction of a specific technology, but also about wider societal and ethical considerations. Now, a practical example with Game of Drones that Paul just mentioned to me before I came up here is maybe Game of Drones is, on a practical level, a, a response to Amazon Prime adverts where you see these drones landing outside a beautiful house with a beautiful couple and somehow delivering a product. I mean, that's a way of trying to look at the future of quadcopters, but it's not really very useful or realistic. We'd like to think that what we went through is a bit more, um, a bit closer to what might actually happen and a bit more useful as a way of interrogating the future. Now, just to move away from the Game of Drones things for a second and back to the, the more general point of this paper, I need to make it clear that writing fictional papers and then writing a real paper about the fictional paper, in doing that we're not simply doing the equivalent of rolling tires across the desert, which my girlfriend Lydia is doing here. Um, there is a point. And the closing passages of the paper compare these, the relative properties of imaginary abstracts with fictional papers. Um, and we aim to leave the reader with a compelling argument for why creating fictional papers can actually play a, play a key role in further, or a role in further empowering HCI's burgeoning design discourse, as we think imaginary abstracts to do too. Um, I'd love it if you all go and read the paper, and in particular read the conclusions of the paper. I'm trying to sum it up here, but it is, it is very difficult, I'm afraid. Um, the most significant contrast between the fictional paper model and imaginary abstracts is an element with some kind of deception. Imaginary abstracts confirm their fictional status up front. They tell the reader. Game of Drones, but they tell the reader first. Game of Drones, on the other hand, and perhaps other fictional papers applying the same model, only inform the reader at the end about the fictional nature of it. The deception also relies on the fictional paper including the fullest possible picture of the story world or the diegetic landscape as possible. 
But in doing so, it puts a burden on the author to go to some considerable lengths to think through the details and, in fact, to properly design elements of the system. In our case, we designed the landing stations, the legislation, the signage, and a few other bits and pieces. But that burden on the author is paid back to the reader. It almost entirely removes the requirement for them to suspend their own disbelief and instead allows them to become part of the magic circle, or in fact doesn't allow them, it almost forces them to, because they're, they're not being told, they're being deceived. To look at the inverse side of that equation, imaginary abstracts place a burden on the reader. They do have to willingly suspend their disbelief and to put effort into immersing themselves into the story world. However, the creation of the design fiction is significantly less onerous for the author, perhaps making imaginary abstracts a bit more of a, a a quick and dirty way to create a design fiction, let's say. It's a lot easier, I would say. And not that they're completely easy. I don't want to offend Mark or anyone who's done them. Um, so the notion of a paper that's submitted to a real venue but is in fact fiction clearly opens up a ethically dubious space. Is it okay to intentionally deceive the reviewers and the readers? Is it okay for the deception to end in a work that's almost entirely fiction being archived alongside other real research? Regardless of the answers to those questions, I'd like to think it's safe to assume that design fiction does have a place in HCI, uh, in HCI research. And the number of design fiction papers at this year's conference, I'd like to think, supports that. If the strengths of these fictional papers are to be harnessed without undermining research ethics and rigor, then the conversations, um, conversations must happen about how to create, review, and publish this kind of work. We need to establish conventions. Now, just to leave you with a few final thoughts. In the paper reflecting on our own work, of course, writing in third person to protect our anonymity, we honestly point out that fictional papers are, putting it colloquially, taking the piss. Using more slang, I, in the review process, one reviewer wrote, at moments, the paper seems to fold in on itself, sometimes a satire of its own existence in a sort of self-satisfied fog of academic wankery. <laughs> now, it's reassuring that despite having this belief, one that I think I and Paul probably share, even though it's our own work, that the reviewer still saw value in the work and gave it a good score, and it finally ended up here. Um, in our rebuttal, we promised that real people would turn up to do the presentation so I've attempted to be as real as possible. Um, although reveling in its own anarchy, which again is something that some, one of the reviewers mentioned, and pushing the boundary of an already weird practice even further, we hope that the paper shows that there really is a case for creating fictional research. However, there, are clearly, there is clearly more work to do if this kind of approach is to become a, a normal feature in future CHI conferences. The conversations about employing fictional papers in real HCI research, I hope, start in earnest here or continue in earnest here. Um, thank you very much. And now, like reviewer three, I'm going to disappear in a puff of logic and maybe take a few quick questions if there's time. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have anyone who want to ask a question? Yes, we do. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Bowie from Northumbria University. Mark Blythe is my primary supervisor, and I've worked with him on imaginary abstracts. Joe knows this, but the audience doesn't. So um, I just wanted to say I've, I've thought all along that imaginary abstracts are kind of a start to developing a fiction. And, and yes, they are easy. Um, uh, 